have permission to record? I'm not sure if it's muted or not. Sounds good. Yeah. Go. Uh, hello, my name is Lance Belderall, and uh, happy to see you guys again. I'll be starting the first point of error right here soon. All right. So Lee Harvey Oswald was not guilty. Let's go into this. So I would like to go into the three points of error I have here, Your Honors. Which, good morning, Mr. Chief Justice and Associate Justice, and may you please the court. I, Lance Belderall, along with my co-counsel, Madel Madison Adam Stephen, will be representing Lee Harvey Oswald in this case before you today. So on Friday, November 22nd, 1963, about 12.30 p.m., shots were fired at the president, in which three people were hit and President Kennedy died. Two days later, on Sunday, November 25th, 1963, Lee Harvey Oswald was killed. So let's look at the three points of I'll be introducing, in which one, all investigation was based on one alleged murderer, and the investigation was based on the presumption of guilt. Two, evidence was ignored, in which the witnesses had mysterious deaths, and some evidence was even changed. And finally, three, the cover-up began immediately, making it a pre-planned part of the original plot. So if we stop right here, we would satisfy all five of these things, which we would satisfy the Warren Commission report. We would satisfy the media of that day. We would have satisfied the police investigations. And we would have satisfied the FBI investigation. And finally, we would have satisfied the Secret Service investigation. But we would not actually, Your Honors, because if we go further than that, we have to... Oh, sorry about that. <clears throat> it's kind of laggy today. <clears throat> So no one knew what was going to happen on that day, right? That's the presumption that we have here, Your Honors. But did they really Did they really not know what was going to happen? Because we have this video right here of which uh, police chief Perry actually knew two days before the visit. Uh, I will be skipping all videos for now in order to make this thing as short as we can. And also going into the first point of error in which all investigation was based on one alleged murderer and the investigation was based on the presumption of guilt. So Lee Harvey Oswald from almost 12.30 p.m. on November 22nd, 1963, was not the only prime suspect. He was the only suspect in this case because information was used by the press to manipulate the narrative to give the public the only logical conclusion that Oswald was guilty. So the only evidence to fit into this narrative was used. Real investigation actually investigates to obtain the criminal and not the criminal to get the crime, Your Honors. So the immediately we begin shifting the burden here because when a person or group of people try to switch either blame from one place and place it on another, this becomes proof that you have a theory before the event. In other words, you actually know what was going to happen. So the people who were in on the conspiracy that day knew what was going to happen based on this kind of logic, Your Honor. So the best evidence of this shifting is actually this Dallas Morning News reporter in which the witness Mary Woodward it said that the shots came from behind her. The grassy no secret service stopped in which the bullets were from behind, Your Honors. So immediately pressure was put on this paper to change the story because the DMN was a morning paper. Mary's account was not circulated until the next day, November 23rd, appearing on page three of section one on the right-hand side below of a large photo of the alleged assassin's view of Elm Street from the sixth floor window of the Texas School Book Depository. And on the left side, left left side of the page were photos of the sniper's nest of the, and the entire building with an article entitled Kennedy Killer Hid in the Area Used Little in the bottom left corner, accompanied by a floor plan showing the assassin's hideout. So these two articles prove that one, the Zapruta film was fake, two shots came from the back, three, the media was still almost 30 years after the fact trying to get the public to buy their story, four, the pressure on the witnesses, and finally five, there was a conspiracy that started before the shooting, which went through the cover-up and continues today, Your Honor. So on August 17, 1980, Dallas Times Herald explanation of the article, despite her assertion that gunfire appeared to be coming from her right, two Dallas reporters decided in 1980 that the whole matter was simply a mistake on Miss Woodward's part. So the same article concluded that this conclusion is contained in an article published on August 17, 1980, defending the Warren Report's conclusions. So with no evidence that they actually spoke to Ms. Woodward or the others, Dog Beto and Hugh Ainsworth of the now defunct Dallas Times Herald provided their own explanations, of which I quote, the origins of the so-called grassy knoll theory of a second gunman can be traced to the simple mistake of a Dallas morning news reporter out for lunch with her cohorts to watch the motorcade. So when Kennedy was shot, she raced, uh, she raced back to the office to file a tearful, horrified account of what she had seen. Gunfire, she wrote, 
came over her right shoulder. That way she was facing, that would mean that the shots would have come from the null. And when her friends saw the story, they rushed in to correct her. The story was corrected for later editions. In spite of affidavits to the contrary, attorney Mark Lane used the woman's uncorrected account of the shooting to bolster his assertion that the gunman, uh, another gunman was involved. So we will show that the Attorney General's office informed the Warren Commissions immediately on what to do, the FBI informed the President Johnson what to do, the press informed the people what to do, and this took coordination and pre-planning before it even took place. And the cover-up continues with misinformation today, Your Honors. And this from Cotton Dutch in uh, AG office, if you read the memorandum, in which it actually says that the public must be satisfied that Oswald was the assassin, that he did not have Confederates who are still at large, and that the evidence was such that he would have been convicted at trial. So speculation about Oswald's motivation ought to be cut off, and we should have some basis for rebutting the thought that this was a communist conspiracy, or, as the Iron Curtain Press saying, a right-wing conspiracy to blame it on the communists, uh, the communists. Unfortunately, the facts on Oswald seem about too pat, too obvious. The Dallas police have put out statements on the communist conspiracy theory, and it was that they were who were in charge when he was shot and thus silenced. So this is an important aspect we should look at. In any investigation, you must establish a motive. So let's look at Oswald's motive for wanting to kill President Kennedy. Why did he want to kill Kennedy? Note that, this, that with this memo, the Assistant Attorney General of the United States is calling for the commission to cut off the questionings of the motive. But we must all ask, why do they want to cut off the motive of Oswald wanting to kill Kennedy? Why do they want to cut this motive off? So I think you can await publication of the FBI report and public reaction to it here and abroad. I think, however, that a statement that all the facts will be made public property in an orderly and responsible way should be made now. We need something to head off public speculation or congressional hearings of the wrong sort, Your Honor. So here are the questions posed we have now. If the investigation was a real one, would you need to come up with a conclusion first before you investigate? This memo clearly explains that the Warren Commission was never intended to investigate the JFK murder, just rubber snap the JFK FBI report. Does this sound like what the government should be doing at all? So the cover-up begins with the motive. If you take out the questions about motive, you may be able to spoon-feed the public the information you want them to know so you can get your pre conclusion and cover up the people who actually did the crime. So this based the investigation on presumption of guilt, Your Honor, in which the extensive plan proves that it was not a lone assassin. The extensive media campaign points out the fact that Oswald investigation began as not an investigation under the presumption of innocence, but a presumption of guilt. So in Oswald's case, the presumption of innocence was never there because instead what it should have been was this, the investigation of assassination of President John F. Kennedy and not just rubber stamping the whole thing. So FBI Hoover to President LBJ, November 29, 1963, in which this testimony has very peculiar conversation. So President John, uh, Johnson asked how many shots were fired and then Hoover replied three and then he further went to say any of them fired at me. So Hoover said, no, all three at the president and we have them. Two shots were splintered, but our ballistic expert was able to prove that they were fired by this gun. So please note on this testimony, only two bullet casings that had been found were sent to DC on Friday. Another bent casing was later sent that next Monday. The bent casing was from a safety plug, was not a casing with a bullet. And what you can see with this testimony is not the beginnings of the story. Three shots from the rifle shot by a lone nut assassin. What do you not see is the motive, the opportunity, and the actual physical evidence here, Your Honor. So to convict people in court, what you need is intent. What was Oswald's intent in committing this crime? What, if anything, did he have to gain? What, if any benefits, did anyone else have to commit the crime? You must prove that he is guilty in court for all these things, Your Honor. But the burden of proof, right? In the United States, a person is presumed innocent until proven guilty because the burden of proof is on prosecution in criminal court cases. If there is a reasonable doubt that the defendant committed a crime, then jurors are instructed to vote not guilty. Only 50% of trials lead to conviction or defendant, and only 25% of trials lead defendants serving a year or more in jail slash prison. Because, however, in Oswald's case, he was presumed guilty, like we've established before, Your Honor. And if we take this further, this step was missing on purpose, but why? Why was it missing on purpose? So instead of a true investigation, fake evidence was used to persuade, like this picture, for example. 
So Oswald's backyard photo, as you can see here, is very peculiar if you look at all these three photos compared side by side, your honors, because the difference is in pictures, right? After the police arrested Lee Harvey Oswald for killing President Kennedy, they searched Ruth Payne's home and found a picture of him standing in the backyard. In one hand, he held a rifle, and the other copies of two communist, uh, communist newspapers, The Militant and The Worker. His wife, Marina, said she had taken the photo in the spring of 1963. So this photo was made public in late February 1963, 1964, simultaneously appearing on the cover of Life magazine and on the front page of the Detroit Free Press. Within days, it had appeared in many other publications, but sharp-eyed observers noticed that the photo appeared to have been tampered with since, since details differed from the publication to publication. In particular, details of the rifle differed. For instance, in the version that appeared on the cover of Life, Oswald's rifle rifle had a sniper scope, but in the version that ran in the Detroit Free Press, the sniper scope was gone. So Oswald put on a fake body. You can see here, if you look at the chin and you can see the difference, the very clear cut you have in this picture here. So this one photo actually proves that Oswald was innocent, Your Honor. On November 22nd, 1963, the police found several incriminating photos of Oswald posing with the Mantlicher uh, Carcano rifle and a pistol. When the police showed that the pictures of Oswald, he said, that is not a picture of me, it was my face, but my face has been superimposed. The rest of it is not the picture. Uh, the rest of the picture is not me at all, and I've never seen it before. So the problems with this picture point out to these seven things, in which Marina Oswald testified to the Warren Commission that she took the photos on March 31, 1963. So the photos show a bright sunny day. The bush beside Oswald is in bloom, but in March, bush, such bushes have not yet begun to bloom. So Oswald's head is erect and a nose casts a V-shaped shadow. In another photo, Oswald's head is slightly cocked, yet the shadow remains the same. The posture of the man is also oddly out of kilter. When one attempts to stand at such an angle, one invariably falls over. So the size of the bodies in both pictures differs. The chin of Oswald in the photos seem more broader and square than the Oswald who was arrested in Dallas. And the weapon Oswald carries uh, was not the one discovered in the TSPD, Your Honor. So again, we have to look at the cut of the chin. You can clearly see below that the chin is a cut and paste job, Your Honor. So the shadow is merely added in too, 100% fake, and even the hand is phony, cut and added onto the right arm in which the arm is a cut and paste object. So how many people knew about the Payne House in Irving before 22nd? Well, only these two people, the FBI and the Dallas police. So the FBI meeting with Ruth Payne on 31st October 1963, an FBI agent, James Hostie, visited Payne's home to discover where Oswald was living. He spoke to both Payne and Marina Oswald about Lee Harvey Oswald. So when, Har when Oswald heard about the visit when he went to the FBI office in Dallas, he went and told that Hostie was at lunch. They left him a message in an envelope. So President Kennedy is shot at 12.30. Here's the time when we start to establish your honors. Which one? Uh, JFK is pronounced dead at one. Two, Officer Tippett is shot dead 106 to 15. Three, JFK is announced dead at 133. Four, Oswald is arrested in the Texas Theater at 140. Five, Oswald in Captain Fritz's office 220. And finally, six, the Payne home is searched at 330. So this is what Police Chief Curry was talking about here, Your Honor. Again, we won't be showing the videos as we want to make this as short as possible. So is it unusual to go by a person uh, person's house by just their name. One of Oswald's arresting officers, Gerald Hill, in which he quotes, we were trying to get together to decide who was going to make the offense report and get all the little technicalities out of the way when a detective named Richard Stavall and another one, G.F. Rose, came out and the four of us were standing when Captain Fritz walked in. So he walked up to Rose and Stavall and made the statement to go uh, to them, go get a search warrant and go get to some address on 5th Street. And I don't recall the actual street number in Irving and pick up a man named Lee Harvey Oswald. So, and I asked the captain why he wanted him, and he said, well, he was employed down at the book depository, and he had not been president for a roll call of the employees. And we said, Captain, we will save you a trip, or to the words of that effect, because there he sits. And with that, he relinquished our prisoner to the homicide and robbery bureau to Captain Fritz. So finally, this detective guy, Rose, says, Mr. Rose, in just a few minutes, Captain Fritz came in, and he instructed me to get two men and go to Irving to the Ruth Payne home. So I went immediately. So the November 23rd newspaper story mentions that the backyard photos, this actually proves that Michael Payne claimed the photographs were taken from his home from the day before, right? So where did the police say they got these pictures again? They said they got it from Ruth Payne's garage. The police arrive at 
the Payne residence at November 22nd, 1963 at 2.30, and the strange facts about the first search of November 22nd, in which Captain Fritz tells the officers to go to Ruth Payne's house. He asked by name, not address. The Dallas PD does not have jurisdiction in Irving in the first place, so Irving PD or the Dallas County Sheriff Department would have had jurisdiction. So why would you search a house that you already knew about in a city that wasn't yours unless they were a part of the conspiracy as well, Your Honor? In which Michael Payne's statements in the photos, he said his testimony in 1964 only acknowledges seeing a backyard photo at the DPD headquarters on the night of the assassination. So now the problem begins here, Your Honors. The police arrest Oswald at 140 for killing President Kennedy, but do not have any evidence at all linking him to the crime. As we've said before, an investigation needs to be a true investigation and not just pin Oswald as the one who did the crime. And so no problem. The police go to Ruth Payne's house and get the information they need to tie the two together. So we have something peculiar going on here. They don't have any evidence for convicting Oswald, and they just go to some uh, Ruth Payne's house. And uh, they even say this during that investigation, which, come in, we've been expecting you. That's very odd, isn't it? Because if you look at that, that's clearly an admission of conspiracy we have there, Your Honors, because they can't give or grant rights to search other people's materials. They can't volunteer or give away of people's materials. And this was done before Oswald was interrogated by a police department without jurisdiction. So we have very odd things going on here. They don't have jurisdiction. They can't even give permission. And now how the police search Oswald's things, they got they actually got the search warrant after they got Oswald's things. So this is one of the statements on the November 22nd, in which it was a search of Payne's home, as you can see here, Your Honors, and Ruth Payne's testimony, which these very things were saying. The police arrived in what occurred, and then Ms. Mrs. Payne says, I went to the door, they announced themselves as both sheriffs from the sheriff's office, and the Dallas police office showed me at least one package or two. And then I was very surprised. Did you say anything? I said nothing, I think I just dropped my draw, and the man, in front of, by the way, of the explanation, we have Lee Oswald in custody. He is charged with shooting a, an officer. This is the first I had any idea that Lee might be in trouble with the police or in any way involved in the day's events. So I asked them to come in, and they said they wanted to search the house. I asked if they had a warrant. They said they didn't. They said they could get the sheriff out here right away with one if I insisted. I said no. That was all right. They could be my guests. And then they did search the house. Nothing was ever said to give permission or consent about searching Oswald's possessions here, Your Honor, because the Warren Commission testimony in which Detective Rose, the 1122 Payne House, you can see that even Miss Marina's Oswald statement on the search, she couldn't even speak English. So it's very odd that we have a perfectly grammatical correct uh, affidavit here for her when she couldn't even speak English. How can someone who didn't speak English write some, something so perfect in an affidavit? This just proves that this was a setup, Your Honor, a conspiracy, in which note the police report, here police detectives get permission from Miss Ruth Payne to search her house. Does she have the right to give permission to search Oswald's personal materials? No, she doesn't have that right because th this was the law of the land back then. In Chapman v. United States, the court ruled that the landlord's consent is insufficient to search the personal uh, personal items or belongings. Oh, sorry about that. Hold on. All right. So we're changing to confine. Ooh, sorry about that. <laughs> All right, so we were at Ruth Payne's garage and the testimony, and here I would like to begin here, Your Honor. In fact, Oswald is arrested before the evidence is checked out in the first place. So at 1.33 p.m. at Parkland Hospital, acting White House Press Secretary Malcolm Kildoff makes the official announcement of President Kennedy's death to reporters gathered in nurses' classroom at the hospital, in which uh, they quote, President John F. Kennedy died at approximately 1 CST today here in Dallas. He died of a gunshot wound to the brain, and I have no other details regarding the assassination of the president. So Oswald was arrested for these three things, right? Without direct evidence tying him to a crime, without a direct witness placing him committing a crime, and without an autopsy or investigation on what caused JFK's death or the direction of the bullets. So the the police go back and go get a search warrant in the next day to check this one car garage and house again, your honors. So the unwarranted search actually proves the cover-up. The reason why they went there without a search warrant was because in order to obtain a search warrant, the requester had to explain the court specifically what it is he is looking for. So if they didn't know what they were looking for, they couldn't apply for a search warrant. So they had an unwarranted search and it was 
um, very peculiar there. So now look at the search warrant here for November 23rd. They've also, they obviously gathered the things and they've got the search warrant after they had the unwarranted search. So the search warrant obtained by Judge Joe Brown Jr. in which it says the evidence to obtain the search warrant was obtained itself through an illegal search of the house the day before. And Judge Brown should not have issued this warrant at all because Judge Brown's father will be the judge in the Jack Ruby case. So Judge Brown issues more search warrants on Ruby, Your Honor. So the search warrant issued was on the basis of illegally obtained information. There is no basis for the first illegal search, no basis for the search warrant, and no basis for Lee Harvey Oswald's arrest at 1.40 p.m. on November 22, 1963, for the murder of the president. Now compare the facts with Detective Rose's statements. Note the following. One, he spent two hours labeling the evidence from the day before. Two, the backyard picture was used by Dallas police Friday evening. It was not discovered on Saturday. And finally, three, the police report is based on facts, not in evidence. So here's his actual statements if you want to um, take a look at it. But here's, here's uh, JFK announced dead at 1.33 p.m., seven minutes later, in which Oswald was arrested for the murder of JFK at 1.40. As you can see here, clearly without evidence, too. So events or conclusions in the Warren Commission prove conspiracy honor. So let's look at let's look at the events and conclusions. One, pictures forged or fake previously to their finding with planted evidence that was tampered with. Two, pictures and information obtained without a warrant and illegal to use in the first place. And finally, three, arrest warrant filed out seven minutes after the official word was announced and before any evidence was obtained, Your Honor. So the police claims it was an open and shut case. It was very peculiar because we do not have a witness who saw him shoot the rifle. So clearly the case against Oswald could not hold up in court because the power... The powers to be this case way to make a public believe a person was guilty. Chief of Police Dallas Jesse Curry later said this too, in which, however, in November 22 to 23, 1963, this was said about Oswald, in which Jesse Curry said before all these things actually went on, Your Honors. Even DA Henry's Wade comments on Friday night, November 22nd, in the NBC TV broadcast, a press interview with District Attorney Henry Wade, whose comments included these I figured we have sufficient evidence to convict him. Oswald, of course, and there's no one else but him because they never tried to search for another person involved in the assassination because they just assumed these that Oswald was the killer. But did they really assume or did they just want to frame it in the first place? So listen to District Attorney Henry Wade. This was taken on Friday, November 22nd, 1963. How can you arrest someone seven minutes without proper legal techniques and without proving that a person actually committed a crime first? Are you not innocent until proven guilty, Your Honor? Because Henry Wade's own words, and uh, sorry, we won't be showing that video, and also Jerry Curry's statements on the evidence, we don't have any proof that Oswald fired the rifle and never did. Nobody's yet been able to put him in that building with the gun in his hand. And the evidence, the fingerprints, anyone? There's no fingerprints on the rifle in the first place. And Oswald was presumed to have killed JFK in the court of public opinion, Your Honor. So now, note the homicide report, date 11 23rd, 63, 5 10 p.m., Oswald fingered despite no evidence. So the newspaper and magazine reports this to be true without proving it at all without evidence. The backyard front page forged picture illegally obtained convicts Oswald in the court of public opinion, and as well as headlines like this genre. So stories appear immediately for afternoon newspaper. The president is asking as Dallas multitude hails him, and before LBJ gets sworn in, Oswald is caught. So public reports of the time, two days after the assassination, the New York Times ran a banner headline that read in part, police say prisoner is the assassin with a smaller but likewise front page heading, evidence against Oswald described as conclusive. The article quoted Captain Will Fritz as the, of the Dallas Police Homicide Bureau as having said, we're convinced beyond any doubt that he killed the president. I think the case is cinched. So plus these quotes, Your Honor, the Philadelphia Inquiry reported, police on Saturday said they have an our airtight case against pro Castro Marxist Lee Harvey Oswald as the assassin of the president. So another one, on the front page of the St. Louis Post-Dispatch was the headline, Dallas Police Insisted Evidence Proves Oswald Kennedy. You have this repeating theme here, Your Honor, of which they keep saying that there is evidence against him when really they just do this to frame Oswald in the first place. They have no evidence. Any evidence that was used was illegally obtained, so they don't have anything to go on, which means this is a conspiracy, Your Honor. The press had to either been manipulated or on it since the very beginning, and the police had to be in or on it from the very beginning or manipulated. Oswald was never going to receive a trial from the beginning, which would prove that Oswald was not only the assassin, but that the police were in on it, Your Honor. So the, now we go to the second point of her. The witnesses see things that report fails to mention. Much of the eyewitness reports that went contrary to the conclusion was either not looked at or failed to be considered. 
in the first place. So eyewitnesses of what they saw, right? The commission's crew of witness consisted of Howard Brennan and Amos Younes, both of whom they said they saw the man fire a rifle, Robert Jackson and Malcolm Couch, the two photographers riding in the motorcade who saw the barrel of the rifle being drawn slowly back at the window after the shots, in which Mrs. Earl Campbell, wife of the city mayor, who was also riding a uh, procession, saw a projection from a depository window. And James Crawford, who saw a movement in the window after the shot, but could not say for sure whether it was a person whom he had seen. Two additional witnesses are added in the report's chapter, The Assassin, in which they are Ronald Fisher and Robert Edwards, both of whom saw a man without a rifle in the window shortly before the motorcade arrived. So what does this say? Public opinion has also on the sixth floor in the sniper's nest. Yes, of course, but the eyewitnesses were not used. So the story doesn't fit at all, Your Honor. Two other sixth floor gunmen witnesses didn't like make quite into the relevant section of the report. <clears throat> One, in fact, never made the report at all. Arnold Rowland saw the gunman 15 minutes before the motorcade arrived at the plaza. However, at this time, the man was in that far southwest left window. And Rowland told the commission that another man was occupied in the southeast corner right window. The commission, whose legal eminencies knew that the other, other man was on the sixth floor at this time, satisfied the legal definition of a conspiracy, sought only to discredit Rowland, rejecting his story and, and under a section entitled, in which accomplices at the scene of the assassination. Miss Carolyn Walder saw the gunman in the right window shortly before the procession arrived. However, she too saw a second man on the sixth floor, although the accomplice she described was obviously different from Rollins. So Rollins sprang his information on the commission by surprise. None of the various reports that him had ever mentioned the second man, and Mrs. Walter, uh, Walter uh, told the second man from the beginning that was totally ignored by the commission, your honors. So the timeline doesn't fit at all on the sixth floor at 12.30 p.m. The only way they could get Oswald down to the second floor was by artificially clicking his descent and slowing up the two witnesses' uh, 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 ascent here, your honor. And Oswald could not have been in two places at once. So this actually solves the conspiracy. It solves the mystery, Your Honor. So if he could not be in two places, obviously a cover-up is going on, but we've already established that. We have to go further than just that, Your Honor. So if we look into Brennan's testimony on November 22nd, 1963, Brennan was unable to identify Oswald as the man he saw in the window, but picked Oswald as the person in a police lineup who bore the closest resemblance to the gunman. Months later, when he appeared before the commission, Brennan said he could have made a positive, he could not have made a, a positive identification at the notification parade, your honors. Which now we go to the third point of error, contradictory evidence was excluded from the whole thing. So the problem is that JFK was hit from the front and the back, your honor. The shots came to the front, as you can see from the, uh, as you can see from the data here, this is where people think where it came from. So if Oswald is in the front of the school book depository when JFK passes, then he could have not fired the bullets from Kennedy. Now the shots from the front became very important at this instance because newly released document proves frontal shot genre. So you can see here, uh, you can see that's actually probably that frontal shot I've been talking about. And even the blood spray was faked on film as you can see from this uh, frame here, your honor, and even the blood spray in the limo, it fits with the frontal shot. So the JFK limo was even clean at Parkland. That's tampering of evidence. They should have not have done that. And that, like I've said before, tampering with evidence, very illegal. They probably have some conspiracy because the only way a crime scene is clean is one, the blood spray doesn't fit with the narrative. Two, the Secret Service are in working with the cover-up. And finally, three, also would have nothing to do with it at all. And this proves that he was innocent, Your Honor. So this is the claim here now that we have. Oswald was on the sixth floor and shot the president. So if JFK got shot from both the back and the front, Oswald could not have done it because that would be impossible from just one window. How could a gun, how could a gun shot shoot from the front of the back? We've already established that. So this photo proves that Oswald was not on the sixth floor at all. Because Carolyn Arnold testified that Oswald was on the first floor at 1225. Oswald was shown to be in the doorway when JFK passed by. He could have not have been on the sixth floor at all, and he was seen 90 seconds later in the lunchroom. So again, we have these very peculiar things going on, which is really impossible to fit together in the narrative of the Warren Commission. So within 90 seconds, Lee is drinking a Dr. Pepper in the second floor lunchroom and meets Officer Baker. And Oswald did not do it. This 
proves it was a conspiracy. Even a, Brit a British reporter from Cambridge News even received a phone call just 25 minutes before Kennedy was shot and was instructed to call the American Embassy in London for some big news before the anonymous tipster hung up, according to an FBI document. After the reporter learned of the assassination, he informed local police about the call who passed information along to the MI5, Britain's domestic security agency. So MI5 informed the FBI of the call and described of the Cambridge News reporter as a sound and loyal person with no security record. So the claim now that we have here is Oswald hated Kennedy. So Oswald hated Kennedy, that's a very weird thing to say because he praised JFK at a public meeting. On October 25, 1963, Oswald accompanies Michael Payne to the American Civil Liberties Union meeting at which he praises Kennedy for his civil works. So this would infer that even in Soviet Russia, when he had no fear of mercy, he would gain admirers for denouncing Kennedy. Oswald never very uh, did in the first place. So Oswald got the job at the TSPD to kill JFK, right? This would be a very weird thing to put into narrative, but it would be very right because he could not have known what would happen when he got the job in the first place, Your Honor. But Oswald could not have been the lone assassin because he would not have the vote in the first place. Unless Oswald had aid or instruction, he was unaware of a future presidential motorcade route. It's, if, as officials claim he was acting by himself, he could not have known until November 19 of this opportunity in Dealey Plaza. The Dallas media did not carry the story with the full route until November 19 at the earliest. The implication of this fact has escaped prior to investigation. If the official timeline is accurate, Oswald has little time to do everything alone in the first place. So here are the questions. The two concepts that Lee Harvey Oswald was doing this alone, right? Taken out by the idea that the two Dallas papers had plunged published two different routes, one on Main Street all the way, and one where they turned down on Houston and then left to Elm. These are the two routes we show here now, Your Honor. This one and the other one on the 21st. So the Dallas Morning News even had one of the routes there on the 22nd, and this is the timeline of which all the activity from November 19th to 22nd. We can go here, as you can see, and now we have a summary of Oswald timeline. So he took the trip announced on September 13, 1963, right? The dates announced on November 4th, 1963, in which the route was announced on December 18th. The route changed on December 19th and published in the newspapers. Oswald didn't have enough time to plan by himself, so Oswald could not have known by himself that the TSPD would be on that round in the first place. There must have been something going on in here, Your Honor. So now we have another claim. Everyone heard three shots from the back. Mary Ann Mormon and Jean Hill, who heard four or five shots, in which the witness statements denied this claim. And they said, uh, again, four to five shots. So four shots proved the conspiracy. And finally, five shots proved the conspiracy. So Newman's proved shots from Rear and Zabuda film were faked. November 22nd, TV interview of Bill Newman states that one shot came from the back behind me, and two, the first shot hit President Kennedy, and he jumped in the seat of the limo. So here's the human interview if you want to view it later, and here's Will's testimony of which the shots from the front limo limo she says in this video. So the photo has Lee RV also in the doorway as JFK passes by. So this one picture proves that the Warren Commission had it wrong when they said these three things that Lee Harvey Oswald was on the sixth floor, that he shot the President Kennedy, and that Lee Harvey Oswald was on the run and killed Officer Tippett. There was no reason to run in the first place for Oswald. So he could not go from the sixth floor to the second floor, but could go from the ground floor to the second. So shots from the front, right? The several police officers on the duty that day who immediately ran towards the null on hearing the gunshots at the president reported they were confronted by men, so, uh, purporting to be Secret Service agents. And Hoffman's testimony was ignored by the FBI investigators when he uh, voluntarily came forward, but his account was verified by a railroad operator named Lee Bowers, who also observed the shooting from the grassy knoll from the vantage point of the control tower. So here's uh, Chief of Police Jesse Curry's frontal shot of which he talks about, and also Acting Press Secretary Malcolm Kilda at a news conference immediately after, in which Dr. Berkeley told me it is a simple matter of a bullet right through the head. And when he asks where the bullet entered his head, it says it's my understanding that it entered in the temple, the right temple, Your Honor. So LBJ and Hoover covered a uh, work up, report cover up. And also, Dallas Con County D DA Henry Wade and Police Chief Jesse Curry answered press questions at 9:32, 11:23. So this is where the cover uh, 22. So this is where the cover-up begins in plain sight, Your Honor. So two press conferences with as District Attorney Henry, right? Attorney Henry Wade faces the press in these two news conferences with President Kennedy. So the first conference took place shortly after Lee was fully charged with JFK's murder, and Oswald was formally charged at 11 26, 1963, and Wade's second news conference occurred in the evening of November 
uh, after Oswald himself had been shot and killed by Jack Ruby. So the claim that we have here now is Oswald escaped by bus. According to the official story, Oswald leaves the TSP at 1233, where Pot he walks several blocks and allegedly aboards the bus number 1213 driven by Cecil McWaters. At the corner of Elm and Murphy Streets, after the bus, which was heading towards Dealey Plaza, becomes stuck in traffic. So Oswald allegedly deport, departs the bus and walks over to the Greyhound bus station at the corner of Jackson and Lamar Streets, where he boards cab number 36, driven by William Whaley. At the time, is now allegedly 1248 in this narrative here, Your Honor. So Roger Crave actually remembers that there was a man standing on the steps of the book depository building, and he turned to me and said, I'm with the Secret Service. So the man was about 40 years old, sandy haired with a distinct cleft in his chin, and he was well dressed in a gray business suit. I was naive enough at the time to believe that the only police were actually officers after all, and this was the command post. I gave him the information. He showed little interest in the person's evening. However, he seemed extremely interested in the description of the rambler. So here, Craig may have had an encounter with the conspirator, and according to the warrant force, he assigned the motorcade uh, to that place in the hospital. So none stated the scene that there was uh, the shooting. None of them stayed. So more of Craig. Fast forward several hours later, Craig heard an arrest being made in connection with the shooting of Officer J.D. Tippett. As he told the Warren Commission, I kept thinking about the subject that had run and got in the car, so I called him Captain Fritz's office and talked to one of his officers and I told him what I saw and gave him a description of the man. So the suspect, of course, was Lee Harvey also in this case. So Mr. Craig, Captain Fritz, then asked him about the, uh, the he said, what about the station wagon? And the suspect interrupted him and said, that station wagon belongs to Mrs. Payne. I believe is what he said. And don't try to tie her into this. She had nothing to do with this. So here we go into the fourth point of error, Your Honor, in which Dr. Jerry Croft, PhD, uh, did a, status, a status statistical comparison of the cause of death of the witnesses connected with the JFK murder and the general population of the U.S., what he found was really stunning here, Your Honor. The cause of death by percentage of 78 people who were connected to the JFK assassination are as follows. 37% murder, 23% accidental death, 17% suicide, and 22% natural causes. Now, the cause of death of the general population in 1970 are as follows. Murder, less than 1%, 9% accidental death, 1% suicide, and 89% natural causes. So, Penn Jones uh, has, we have these series of videos in which they have these very mysterious deaths, right? We even have these uh, things about their mysterious deaths, which Karen Cook. Cups in it, TV's host daughter who was overheard the telling of JFK's death prior to 1123. The first person to die linked to the case was Karen Kupsik. So in his book, Forgive My Grief, W. Penn Jones reports that a few days before the assassination, Karen Kupsinet, 23, was trying to place a long-distance telephone call from the Los Angeles area. According to reports, the long-distance reporter heard Ms. Kupsinet scream into the telephone that President Kennedy was going to be killed. Karen's body was discovered on the 30th of November 1963, in which the police estimated that he had, she had been dead for two days. The New York Times reported that she had been strangled. Her actor boyfriend, Andrew Prine, was the main suspect, but he was never charged with murder, and the crime remains unsolved. So we have very peculiar deaths going on here when they were connected to the case genre, in which even Grant Stockett had a very peculiar death, and he was a close friend of John F. Kennedy. And also Dorothy Killigan, and also Margaret Smith, Dorothy Kilgallen, a crime reporter of the New York Journal, obtained a private interview with Jack Ruby. She told friends that she had information that would break the case wide open. Aware of what had happened to Bill Hunter and Jim, uh, <coughs> sorry, Jim Cully, she had she handed her interview notes to her friend Margaret Smith. On 8th November 1965, Kilgallen was found dead. It was reported she had committed suicide, and her friend Margaret Smith died two days later. Very interesting what we have going on here. And Roger Craig, he was on duty in Dallas on November 22nd, 1963. After hearing the firing of President John F. Kennedy, he ran towards the grassy knoll where he interviewed witnesses up to the shooting. About 15 minutes later, he saw a man running from the back door of the Texas Book Depository down the slope of Elm Street. He then got into a Nash station wagon. Craig saw the man again in the office of Captain Will Fritz, and it was recently arrested. It was the recently arrested Lee Harvey Oswald. So when Craig told the story about a man being picked up by the station wagon, Oswald replied, the station wagon belongs to Mrs. Payne. Don't try to tie her into this. She had nothing to do with it. That same quote shows up again, Your Honor, which Craig was also same with Samer Weitzman when the rifle was found on the sixth floor of the Texas Book Depository. He insisted that the rifle was a 7.65 monster, not a man, not a man like, like her Carcano. Roger 
uh, we keep continuing on with this testimony here, Your Honor, which in 1967, Roger D. Craig went to the New Orleans and was a prosecution witness at the trial of Clay Shaw. Later that year, he was shot at while tape walking to a car park. The bullet only grazed his head, but in 1973, a car forced Craig's car off the mountain road. So we, he was badly injured, but he survived the accident. In 1974, he was surviving another shooting in Wax Chain, uh, Waxahachie, Texas, in which the following year he was seriously wounded when his car engine exploded. Craig told his friends that the mafia had decided to kill him. Craig was found dead on 15th May 1975, and it was later decided that he had died as a result of self-inflicted gunshot wounds. So another one having a mysterious death, your honors. We keep continuing these series and streaks of mysterious deaths, and even we have a super. Uh, we have a picture here, right? You can see obviously this was not Oswald Oswald, uh, Oswald in the picture at all. So all these things corroborate statements that this was a conspiracy after all. And finally, onto the fifth point of error, in which the entire case falls apart against Oswald John. So the murder of J.D. Tippett. Uh, we see that Myers reportedly omits important information that contradicts his conclusion in the first place. On several occasions, Myers buries important contrary information in his end notes, which he surely knows most readers will not bother to study. So Myers repeatedly reaches conclusions that are contradicted by his own raw data. So Myers fails, uh, frequently relies on FBI interview, interview summaries, but he never mentions that numerous witnesses complain that those summaries were inaccurate and incomplete. And finally, uh, Myers fails to mention that any witness has changed their stories in the favor of the lone gun incident scenario by the time they testified before the Warren Commission months after they given the initial statements. So the Tippett murder, now we go on to that. J.D. Tippett was one of the few officers in Dallas police force who would not be called to daily positive to help investigate the assassination, of which my co-counsel will further address the Tippett murder, if you honor. And also the problem was, is, and Oswald was in the Texas theater. Now it comes to two wallets, right? So Bob Barrett claims that Captain W.R. Westbrook asked him about the names Oswald and Hill while he was thumbing through the IDs of a wallet he was holding at the Tippett scene. So interesting to note here, Your Honor, was that Captain Westbrook was in charge of hiring officers and had a desk job. However, on this day, he was here at the Texas Theater and TSBD, later go to the Vietnam and some things. Lee Harvey Oswald now has two identity in which it's Lee Harvey Oswald on the left and Alex Hill on the right. It's very suspicious having two wallets. So both wallets were found on the day, in which one was on Lee Harvey Oswald and one was at the Tippett murder scene. So do people carry two wallets with them when they commit crimes? Let's start asking questions here about the case in order to further crack this down. So would a person who just shot the president carry two wallets with him? It's very suspicious. So, but would they throw down the casings on the ground? Would they have even stayed in Dallas in the first place? And what is the chance of catching a person in 60 minutes after killing the president? If Oswald did not have two wallets, then this proves a conspiracy, which is government for genre. So now we have these four questions to be answered. How does all of this take place? How does an unemployed worker shot the president then escapes by bus in a cab to his rooming house? How does he pick up a pistol, kills Officer Tippett, but yet surrenders to the police in the theater? How does he die two days later by the hands of Jack Ruby? The last question is the best to conclude on, Your Honor, in which the man on the right above is FBI James Bookout. He is the one who got filmed. The man on the right is above is FBI James Bookout. He is the one who got filmed in the so-called live footage of Ruby shooting Oswald's so-called live footage of Ruby shooting Oswald. So we have very peculiar things going on here, your honors. But very little is what you have known before. Now we have these irrefutable facts I've shown you today. There's two Rubies, two directions of shots, two wallets, two political victims, and finally, two Oswalds. Now the final conclusion, or just one conclusion we have here, your honor, was that Lee Harvey Oswald was framed and was not guilty of killing President of the United States, JFK. Here is the closing statement I would like to bring now. The problems here are six in full. One, the arrest was made before the evidence was obtained. Two, search warrants issued were based upon illegal information. Three, evidence planted the backyard photo. And four, the shots came from many directions. Five, Oswald was placed at 1230 in the doorway of the TSBD. And finally, six, the Warren Commission assumed guilt. They did, never, they did not prove it at all. So I would like to... Uh, I would like to conclude on all these matters, Your Honor, in which if uh, please overturn the report of public opinions, because Oswald is not guilty for any of these things, Your Honors. He was framed from the very start of there being conspiracy before the shooting ever happened in the first place. And there's still problems occurring today with this information that we have, Your Honor. So if there are no more further questions, I will let my co-counsel speak. 
Uh, go to your slide. Gotcha. So it should be here in your drive. Jack, I'm on the air. This one. You, uh, All right. Just make sure to put it on the present. Sure, you got it. You got it. All right. Okay. Good morning. And I will begin on the second speech, which is mostly going over the killing of Officer Tipton. I'll give it a second so that the, it can work. So the one crime mission has, has made four major flaws. One, they stated that Oswald killed John F. Kennedy. Two, they stated that Oswald tried to flee the country. Three, Officer Tippett knew to go to Oswald's boarding house somehow. And four, the warrant report cannot be correct unless Tippett was involved in the plot. Now, Oswald was not seen on the sixth floor of this picture, of, um, in which a witness took at uh, around 1225. Um, since, uh, note that the witness was uh, was not standing directly in front of the sixth floor window. Um, a was marked the spot of the sixth floor alleged sniper's nest. B marked the spot of the open window on the fifth floor. Uh, C know that the President Kennedy's limo was about seven minutes, seven or eight minutes behind schedule and was supposed to be at the trademark at 12.30. And D, if the sniper was on the sixth floor, the window was closed. Now since the window was closed, there was no possible way that a sniper could have prepared in under five minutes. Now, yes, it was behind, but no one had any way of knowing that. And considering the fact that uh, the president was supposed to be on his way in uh, about five minutes, you would think that if someone really was trying to shoot President Kennedy from that sixth floor window, then they would have been more prepared and the window would have at least been open. Now, this is a photo of Lee Harvey Oswald on the doorway of, as JFK passed. Now, how can a man uh, be on the main floor and runs up five or six flights of stairs in order to go and kill the president to a window that was still closed. Now, simply said, if Oswald did not shoot Kennedy, why would he, why would he shoot Tippett? Now, at 140, uh, 1.43 p.m., Sergeant Pete Barnes pulled up pulled up at the crime scene and began to take pictures of what had taken place with Officer Tippett. Now, let's just note that the time was 1.43. Uh, that is three minutes after they arrested Lee Harvey Oswald in the Texas theater for killing the same police officer. Uh, now, JFK was announced dead at 1.33 p.m. Just seven minutes later, Oswald was arrested for the murder of John F. Kennedy uh, at about 1.40 without any evidence. And now here we have the police report, which just states that they were arresting, arresting Lee Harvey Oswald for the murder of JFK without, and as you can see on the arrest report, there was no evidence to be held on that. Now, Oswald could not be arrested at 1.40 unless, unless it was a conspiracy. This is because, one, no, no identification to the web could, to the weapons used were made to connect them with Lee Harvey Oswald. Two, no evidence tying the two crimes together was established yet. And three, the evidence, uh, there was no evidence in the police's hands yet. Uh, witnesses, uh, now right at this time, I'll take some time to look at the witnesses and see what they said around, uh, what they saw before 140, uh, the time that Officer T uh, Tippett was killed. Now here's, uh, now, we're not actually going to go through any of the videos because, again, we have to make this as short as possible, uh, but you can go through them at your own time. This man, he was talking about the atomic weapon that was used to shoot Tippett and how he says that uh, the shells didn't really match up. Uh, here we have Helen Markham, uh, in which she stated, uh, as if you cross apply my co-counsel statement, uh, she stated that she closed her eyes and put, basically put her hands over her eyes uh, while he was coming towards her in the, because she basically she was scared because she heard bullets everywhere. And this is one uh, of a man discussing how he can, uh, excuse me, uh, discussing about how he could not identify him unless he shot, unless he was person shooting himself. Now, uh, the tip, discussing the Tippett murder, taking, uh, taking statements from the selective witnesses. The Dallas Police and the Warren Commission decided to take information from the selective witnesses who saw or said they saw the exact same things as the foregone conclusion. Now, Ms. Clemens came out of the house when she heard gunshots that resulted in the murder of Dallas Police Officer J.D. Tippett. Uh, Ms. Clemens observed two men, one short and heavier and, the, and another one tall and thin, and said that she observed the shorter man with the gun and the unarmed man was the one who fled down Patton Avenue. Now, here's uh, Ms. Clemens, uh, basically her statement, which you can go over at your own, uh, later on. Now, if we were to believe in the Warren Commission, then that means that we believe that, the arrest, that we arrested the killer of the president seven minutes after the official announcement of his death. Uh, that means that we arrested the killer of Officer Tibbet three minutes before the police show up to investigate the 
to even investigate the crime scene. And three, uh, the arrest report states that he killed both gentlemen before the crime was even investigated. Um, so if obviously none of these really piece together, the time frame is very off, and there's no way that anybody could gain any sort of evidence, which I will go for uh, go on more about later on in my speech in this presentation. Um, so basically, we cannot believe the Warren Commission. Uh, witnesses had Lee, Har Lee Harvey Oswald in the Texas Theater. Now, Butch Burroughs was a ticket collector and somebody who was working on the at the concession stands of the Texas Theater uh, the, on November on November 22nd, 1963. And what she stated that he saw Oswald come into the theater between 1 and 1.07 p.m., making Oswald's alleged 115 shooting of Officer, T Officer Tippett impossible. Uh, and here is just uh, ba basically an interview with the police and the witness, uh, police witness, Detective Bentley, in which he stated he found the driver's license, uh, Lee Harvey Oswald's driver's license in his billfold. Now, Lee Harvey Oswald had never had a driver's license, so we're very confused as to how he could have found his driver's license. Seven minutes later, um, Oswald was arrested for the murder of John F. Kennedy at 140, and again, here's the police report. And this just, again, goes into the to Jer uh, Officer Gerald Hill's report on the arrest of Lee Harvey, Harvey Oswald at the Texas Theater on the day that it occurred. Um, now, Bernard Jade Hare's testimony. Now, Jade, Bernard, uh, excuse me, Bernard, Bernard Hare owned Bernie's Hobby House, which was located two doors east of the Texas Theater. Mars, any, Mars interviewed Hare in the summer of 1987 and followed these, uh, and the following was revealed in the interview. Basically, what what he stated was that he saw Lee Harvey Oswald being arrested through the back of the Texas Theater. Uh, later, he was told that Lee Harvey Oswald was arrested through the front. He saw um, some, he heard many people talking about it throughout the town, and he was very confused due to the fact that he saw a man who looked exactly like Lee Harvey Oswald being arrested through the back. And he even stated, I do not know who I saw arrested that day. Uh, and I guess neither do we. Uh, uh, now, this is uh, another interview discussing about how Lee Harvey Oswald was arrested on the main floor, which again does not go in hand with Hare's testimony. Now, two Oswald were two Oswalds were arrested that day, and this just leads to a further uh, to further proof that there was a conspiracy. Now, the autopsy request signed at the hospital. The Warren Commission claimed that the shooting of the officer Tippett took place between 1.08 and 1.15 p.m. on Friday, November 22, 1963. However, here in the request for the autopsy signed at the Methodist Hospital, they had the time of death at exactly 1.15. Now, here's, again, the hospital report. You can see that he was uh, declared dead at 1.15. So the Warren Warren Commission states that it was between 108 and 115. They did not even actually go through all of all of the evidence that was handed to them. Um, we can't really trust the Warren Commission if they're still going to feed us lies. And here is a video that just basically goes through the fact that uh, evidence was planted at the Tippett scene, uh, which was Oswald's wallet and, uh, and a jacket. Now, this was found shortly at, uh, before his arrest for killing Officer Tippett and John F. Kennedy. Uh, Captain Westbrook was at the scene of the billfold recovery and at the, and at the scene of the jacket recovery. Captain Westbrook, Westbrook led Lee Harvey Oswald out of the front of the Texas, uh, out of the Texas theater. Now, Captain Westbrook was the head of personnel of downtown Dallas. Um, he had really no reason to be going around town trying to find evidence and then again arresting Lee Harvey Oswald. That's not in his job description. Um, Captain Westbrook uh, was kind of a very strange character. Uh, the famous John F. Kennedy researcher Bill Simbich uh, concludes that I think he was involved, uh, concludes that he thinks that he was involved with framing Oswald for the assassination. Uh, this is because um, basically Westbrook and Hill, which I will get to later on, were at every scene where evidence was found. Now, uh, after November 22nd of 1963, Captain Westbrook uh, was appointed out of the, uh, Captain Westbrook's role as a police advisor in South Vietnam meant that he was working for the uh, United States Agency for Internal Development, which therefore meant that he was working for the CIA. So again, as uh, right after the John F. Kennedy assassination and the killing of Officer Tibbet, uh, Captain Westbrook was moved uh, out of the state, but uh, he went to Vietnam and is, began to work with the CIA. Captain Westbrook and Sergeant General Hill. Oh, 
They were in the personnel office at the time of the shooting of John F. Kennedy. Sergeant Hill was transferred to work under Captain Westbrook in October of 1963, which was about a month before the assassination of John F. Kennedy and the killing of Officer Tibbet. Now, after shooting, uh, they left. And after the shooting, uh, they left Captain Westbrook's office to go to the Texas School Book Depository building, in which Sergeant Hill was on the was one of the policemen who fled the who found, excuse me, found the shell casings on the sixth floor. After finding the bullet casings, Captain Westbrook and Sergeant Hill drove to the ship at murder scene. Uh, at that time, Captain Westbrook recovered the wallet of Lee Harvey Oswald, complete with his IDs and some, and a driver's license, which again, as my co-counsel stated, uh, there was more than one wallet with more than one ID, in which nobody should really have there was only ever one id on record and there was no way that a driver's license could have been found due to the fact that he had no driver's license uh this is how the police uh but going back to the point due to the fact that they found his wallets with his ids that's how the police somehow knew to look for tippett's killer which they concluded somehow was lee harvey oswald now sergeant hill and captain westbrook um it, it's not a coincidence that hill transferred to the personnel bureau at the same uh in the same month in which oswald obtained his job as job at the Texas School Book Depository. It would clearly stand to reason that Hill was transferred, uh, most likely by Westbrook, to the personnel bureau so that he and Westbrook could, could discuss any planning of the assassination without having to do so in public or by telephone, which they could have been overheard or just monitored in general. In general. Uh, it is entirely possible that, uh, that Hill admitted to the admitted to the FBI that he had transferred to the personnel bureau in October 1963 because he didn't realize or believe that he would bring him bring him under suspicion. This could also explain why Hill di didn't hesitate to tell the Warren Commission that he was on a special assignment with the personnel bureau. It is also curious that the, that the DPD personnel assignments booklet in November 1963 lists Hill as being as a patrol division, uh, in which he hadn't really ever been before. Now, moving on to the planting of more evidence. Now, Oswald obtained, uh, maintained uh, the entire time that Oswald was in custody of the police, he maintained the idea that he did not shoot anyone or even threaten anyone. Now, Brest Westbrook and Hill show up at, showed up at the Tippett crime scene just in time to involve, be involved in the arrest of Oswald and the Texas Theater. Two important pieces of evidence to tie Oswald to the crime appear only after Westbrook and Hill show up. Uh, basically, what I'm trying to say here is that there were really no shell casings or IDs or anything to tie the Harvey Oswald to any of the killings uh, until after Westbrook and or Hill showed up to any of the crime scenes. Now, here's uh, basically the schedule of the movement of Sergeant Hill's day on, on the day of the assassination and killing of Officer Tippett. Now, at 12.30, uh, he was at Westbrook's office. Around 12.47, he was en route to, te to the Texas School Book Depository in car 207, which was the same car that will appear again outside of Oswald's room, uh, rooming house, which my co-counsel went over in his presentation. At 1.17, he discovered the shell casings on the sixth floor. At 1.30, tip the Tippett murder scene uh, at the Tippett murder scene, he discovered shells there as well. And at 1.40, he arrested, uh, the arrest of Oswald at the Texas Theater took place. Uh, this is a very fast moving, uh, this is a very fast moving schedule in which it only, it took about an hour for uh, Lee Harvey Oswald to be charged with the murder that no real evidence was there to tie him, which again, I went over earlier in my presentation. Um, it's clear here that anywhere that Sergeant Hill or Westbrook went, evidence just somehow appeared. So either they got really, either they got really lucky that day or it was a conspiracy that they were involved in. Uh, now first we're gonna discuss the pistol. pistol. Uh, now the pistol was discovered after the scuffle. The police claimed that Oswald shouted, this is it. Sergeant Hill wrote up that the police report, uh, wrote up in the police report of this incident and was the only policeman who was on the scene of the bullet casings in the Texas School Book Depository, uh, the Tippett murder scene, and the Oswald's arrests. Uh, second, Oswald's jacket. Now, Oswald was allegedly uh, allegedly discarded a light gray zipper jacket in the parking lot behind the Texaco service station on the Jefferson Boulevard after he allegedly shot Tippett. Now, the Warren Commission credited the discovered, discovery of the jacket to Westbrook. Uh, he did he had in fact stated that he did not find it. According to Westbrook, uh, the jacket was pointed out by him uh, by either by either some other officer. Uh, Further on, further on during in his testimony, Westbrook explained that some officer, I feel sure, sure it wasn't, I'm sure it was an officer, I still can't be positive, 
pointed the jacket out to me and and it was laying slightly under the rear of one of the cars. Uh, isn't it strange that Westbrook and Hill both keep in, keep on popping up in the, uh, as the evidence appears on that day? Uh, now, which way makes more sense here? Uh, there are only two things that could possibly be true about this investigation, and that's either that one, Captain Westbrook and Sergeant Hill were just extremely lucky all day on November 22, 1963, being at the right place in the right time all day long, or two, Captain Westbrook and Sergeant Hill were part of the, part of the planned and direct cover-up of the plant of evidence on Lee Harvey Oswald, which would be a conspiracy. Now, General, this is some of General Hill's General Hill's background. Excuse me. General Lynn Jerry Hill was a ser sergeant working as a desk job, working at a desk job um, at, Dal at Dallas Police Headquarters when he was when he was thrust into the spotlight on November 22, 1963. When he learned that President John F. Kennedy uh, had been shot, Mr. Hill raced across downtown Dal Dallas on the Texas Gulf Depository. He was one of the three lawmen who located the sniper's nest and the three and three spent shell casings near the sixth floor window. He was one of the several men on uh, at the officer to fit murder scene that and later that day, Mr. Hill handcuffed and accused of, assassin, uh, uh, of the accused assassin, which was Lee Harvey Oswald, uh, which he was arrested at the Texas Theater in, o in Oakland again. Uh, this made him the only man in Dallas to be at all three events in person at, uh, at important times of that day. Before entering the, Tex uh, the Dallas Police Department in 1955, he worked for the Dallas Times-Herald newspaper uh, and the w WBAP TV. Uh, again, this was the car that showed up at the Texas School Book Depository and then was later outside of uh, Oswald's boarding house. Again, so Gerald Hill was the one driving this car. Now, 1.40 p.m. on November 22, 1963, uh, this, these are the things that the police knew. Uh, there were no ballistic tests. Uh, there, there was either a weapon or there wasn't. There were no eyewitnesses to the shootings. There was no lineup. There was no evidence. But at 1.40, the, the, the Dallas Police Department did arrest uh, Lee Harvey Oswald. Now, how can they arrest a man when they have no evidence at all to tie anybody to the murder, let alone Lee Harvey Oswald? Again, here is the police. Uh, this is a police arrest Oswald for the murders of Tippett and JFK. And we can see, again, what he's being charged with. And this was Gerald Hill's uh, accounting of what had happened. Uh, what happened that day? Uh, again, you can go through it, go go over it at your own time. Again, this is a thirty-long minute video, so I don't really think we should make this longer than it has to be. Uh, this is another one of Sergeant uh, Sergeant Hill discussing the three bullet casings uh, that he found that day. And this was uh, this is a video about Sergeant Hill about what he saw whenever, basically his point of view of what happened at the time which, in which Lee Harvey Oswald was being arrested at the Texas Theater. And these are Oswald's own words on the subject of the killing in which he basically stated that he had no part in it. Now the, uh, let's review a few things. One, for Tippett to be, uh, to have been, been murdered by Oswald, Lee Harvey Oswald would have had to shot the president uh, in which he did not. Two, for, for Tippett to, to have been murdered by Oswald, Lee Harvey Oswald was trying to escape Dallas. Three, the Dallas police go search a house in, in another city without a warrant, greeted by the door by a lady who said that they were expected and were told to go in, to go to go to, ha to the house by the address, but by the name of the person who owned the house. Uh, here are the two reports on which police had only two bullet casings and uh, one live bullet on 11 22nd, uh, on, excuse me, on November 22nd, 1963, which clearly provide, uh, providing a conspiracy and not, uh, and don't really tie the, bring Oswald to court. Uh, again, these are just the reports which discuss the bullet casings. Uh, the USSR thoughts on the murder. Now, the CIA notes on the May 1964 conversion of the Soviet leader, Nick uh, leader who said he didn't believe in American security was too in inept. That Kennedy was killed without without a conspiracy. Now he believed that the Dallas Police Department to be an accessory to the assassination. The CIA source got the impression that the chairman uh, got the chairman got the impression that the chairman had 
some dark thoughts about the American right wing being uh, being behind this conspiracy. Um, source said that Oswald and Ruby were both mad and acted on his own. Uh, he said that flatly that he did not believe this and that, again, it was a conspiracy within the government. Uh, basically explaining that this case was cinched. Now, the CIA admits uh, that Oswald was trained by them. Now, here's the conf uh, what was supposed to be a confidential CIA report discussing the discussing basically Lee Harvey Oswald's involvement with the government when it came to the uh, assassination of John F. Kennedy and Officer Tippett. Now, Oswald didn't, uh, now, Oswald not alone. Government said, Oswald was not alone if he did, was a part of this crime. And the government said so uh, about 40 years ago. In 1979, the House Select Committee of, on Assassinations, when they ruled that, they, that there was a high probability that there were more than one shooters there was more than one shooter involved in the JFK murder and that the assassination was a result of conspiracy. Again, the government admitted to this. Now, some of the help, uh, some of the help could have been the police. Uh, look at the statement of November 23rd, 1963, that reflected the following misstatements. One, Oswald could, told them his possessions were on the garage of Ruth Payne's home. Two, Captain Fritz got a search warrant. Three, the home was searched. Four, two photos of Oswald holding the murder weapons were found. Now, all of these, all, excuse me, all of this was obtained the day before without any search, without a search warrant, uh, which, again, could have been planted and basically uh, can be seen as complete lies. Uh, again, here are the interviews with Lee Harvey Oswald on November 23rd. Now, why would Captain Fritz lie? Now, his own people uh, testified that they got the materials from, or from, uh, from Irving on Friday, not Saturday. Uh, the search warrant was gone after the fact. The search warrant was obtained by the wrong police department. The evidence would not have been allowed in court or trial. Uh, was this the reason? Knowing that this case would not go to trial to be the reason why the uh, would not go to the trial be the reason why this investigation took this road. Uh, maybe look at who Fritz was. He was an FBI. Uh, FBI agent James Hody was at the was at the Payne home on October 28th. Ta uh, talking about Oswald. He knew that about Oswald, uh, but never told Captain Fritz. Now, FBI James Book, uh, Bookout was the person who shot Oswald two days later, which again, my co-counsel went through on this presentation. Now, the FBI questioned Oswald on, questioned Oswald on November 22nd, 1963, uh, which show up on, in other places in this plot, which again, here's a little overview of what occurred that day. Oswald was not uh, again. Oswald was not alone. The government admitted to being a part of it. And now this goes against the Warren report uh, that they that found the following: uh, the commission was found that Lee Harvey Oswald one owned and possessed the rifle used to kill President Kennedy and wound Governor Colony. Two bought this rifle into the depository building in the morning of the assassination. Three was present at the time of the assassination at the window from which the shots were fired. Four, killed Dallas police officer J.D. Tippett in an apparent attempt to escape. Five, resisted arrest by drawing a fully loaded pistol and attempting to shoot another police officer. Six, lied to the police after his arrest concerning important substantive matters. Seven, attempted in April 1963 to kill Major General Edwin A. Walker. And eight, possessed the capa uh, capability with a rifle, rifle, which would have enabled him to commit the assassination. On the basis of these findings, the commission was concluded that Lee Harvey Oswald was the assassin of John F. Kennedy. Uh, now we're gonna count things that do not add up, which was one, there are two or three, three, two or three wallets that no one carries that many wallets around with that many IDs. Two, one or two Oswalds. Uh, again, two Oswalds were arrested that day, uh, both basically at, both at the Texas Texas theater, which only further proves the conspiracy. Three, the atom atomic weapon or a pistol. Um, there's no real answer from the Warren Commission. Four, the time frame, again, does not add up. Five, escaping or going home. Uh, six, Hill and Westbrook, which there's a lot of evidence that they planted all the evidence that was found to better go in hand with the conspiracy. Uh, now, We've asked you not to convict Lee Harvey Oswald. He did not commit these crimes, and if he did now, if he was a part of these crimes, he was not the one who committed them alone. Uh, he, this was a conspiracy involved with the government. Now, uh, with that, I conclude.
Stop the screen share. Okay, oops. Now get the big screen and they're going to talk with you and you're going to present. Is it still recording? Yeah, good. Yeah, okay, good. Bird. Okay, if you could do your presentations now or you could make some comments. You're directing that to us, Mike. Oh, the volume was low the whole time. I didn't know that. <laughs> I can't hear you. All right. Larry, would you like to go? Would you like to go first, Larry? Sure. sure. We've got a guy in that You see the next Go ahead. Um, go ahead, Dan. Go how Oswald said that that was Ruth Payne's. I never actually thought to actually corroborate that with the two Oswald statements, and now that you're saying it, it actually looks very interesting. It actually uh, fits in with the time for the Warren Commission. It lets them signal the second Oswald, as you said, and it actually fits in with the narrative that was given to the people that day that Lee Harvey Oswald did all of this acting alone. So I would find it very, uh, how should I say this? I, I've never even I've never even thought to uh, do it like that. You know, Jim, if I can interject something here really quick. Sure. Also, sure. if you look at the uh, what happened took place in uh, Captain Fritz's office when he tells the uh, officers to go to Ruth Payne's house, they don't say the address. They say go to Ruth Payne's house, and right, then right. you mention this other two. These all start cooperating that the police and everybody else may have already known all about this. And I know the FBI agent had to because he was out there on October 28th. So Ruth Payne has to play a lot more important role than what it was ever let out to be. Oh, absolutely. Oh, absolutely. And, uh, 
She was tied to her husband, husband to the CIA. CIA. She was responsible for getting Lee the job at the book depository. So she was it, involved in setting him up as the patsy. And the fact that she would grant permission, you know, for the search, even knowing they were coming in advance, is further in, in, incriminating evidence of the complicity of Rain Lee. Jim, Jim, I would like to add, I'm sorry uh, to interrupt, but I would like to add also that uh, there, uh, Michael Payne was overheard that night in a telephone conversation uh, speaking to somebody and, and uh, speaking to Ruth, act, actually, uh, when he called uh, the, the house that night. And he was very, very candid about it. He said, uh, you know, we know, uh, both of us know who's behind all of this, okay? And uh, that's something that's never been explained. Yes, yes, yes. Ma Madison, I thought your discussion about Westbrook and Hill was simply excellent and that you did uh, indicate, I thought, that Hill had been transferred to be working directly with Westbrook. Are we still connected to the studio? Yes. 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 To, to be working with Westbrook so they could plan out together the steps they would take to incriminate him uh, the two wallets is obviously very damning. That Westbrook doesn't quite understand how the jacket sewed up. It's all suggested that the two of them were, in fact, planting the evidence. I thought this was all really simply excellent, that the amount of work, the energy you'd invested in doing research in the relatively brief time since the last uh, presentation was uh, virtually spectacular. I'm, I'm very, very impressed by both of your efforts. Good, good work. Well done. Thank, Thank you so you. much. That means a lot coming from uh, people like yourself. If you could give us a, a, a shortened version, I guess, of your presentation, because the recordings are good now, so we'd like to keep it off for posterity on your presentation. Uh, you mean uh, 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 of last time, Mike? Yeah, yeah if you don't mind. Uh... Let me see if I can uh, pull it up. I'm going to have to uh, uh, set up to do it. Give me just okay. one in, second in the, here. In the, in Larry, the go ahead and comment. In the meantime, yeah. Uh, first of all, the uh, gentleman's the young man's uh, name, because I have Madison, but uh, the other... Uh, Lance. Lance. Right. Lance Belderall. Lance. Mm -hmm. Okay, Lance. Okay, good. Okay, now, uh, see, I, I, I uh, logged in a little late. That's why I'm asking. Uh, oh, yeah, well, you know, the, the, um, you put a lot of, a lot of really, really good information, you know, and uh, I really like the way that you started to uh, cite precedent, you know, because that's exactly what you're supposed to do in a court of law. You know, you're supposed to be factual and analytical. Uh, you cannot uh, jump to conclusions, you know, because that's for the jury to decide, right? And, and what, you're, what you want to do is exactly what you started to do. You started to uh, uh, cite precedent, okay, court cases, which is really, really good. But we need to expand that into other areas, okay? Uh, now, the backyard photos is really excellent. But you know that we have an update on that where we have done uh, not just – you showed the uh, uh, Oscar White overly on the face, but now we have done – uh, the ent entire uh, physique, you know, the torso and everything, and it matches perfectly. I've done a, uh, an entry in my blog there that's, uh, uh, that's really uh, covers all the aspects of this. And in fact, even goes further and talks about how Roscoe White was, uh, uh, had been trained in photography, was an expert in, in uh, altering people's faces and not the body. Okay, and he was even proud of, of his abilities to do that. And, and a lot of other really interesting uh, aspects of Roscoe White's life. Okay, now uh, I like the part, the, the illegal search, which I just uh, mentioned, you know, the precedent and everything. Um, now you covered uh, the point about uh, that they had been expecting them. And I added that Michael Payne that night spoke on the telephone with Ruth and said, we both know who was responsible um, and you know what is admissible and not as admissible. That's excellent stuff to cover. Uh, now you talked about the affidavits, and you got and, and both of you will include affidavits. And just a little word of caution: yes, uh, in, 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 within a reasonable amount, okay. But because let, let me just say this: uh, if you look at the affidavits that Patsy Collins subscribed, okay, um, 
and you and you look at the so-called signatures of the uh, people that are giving these affidavits, you will know that they're the, the, the exact same handwriting. You know, so a lot of these people did not sign these affidavits. And like you say, you know, a lot of this stuff was made up, you know, by the Dallas Police Department. So uh, that's hey, I'm sorry. Larry, on Margarita as well, she could not understand English, but yet her uh, affidavit was written in perfect. Yeah, Marina. Yeah, Marina, of course. Yeah, yeah, that's a, a great example also. Uh, now, now I, when, when you start to analyze the Dallas Police Department's actions that day, you have to take in, into consideration that the Dallas Police Department, Department was dancing to the FBI's tune all along. They were, in fact, the, the Dallas Police Department had their, their investigation, you know, going on the way it was supposed to be done. But Hoover and the FBI came upon, came down on Dallas and they confiscated all records. They took over the investigation. They said, Oswald is guilty. We're going to handle this. And, and uh, you know, and they, they totally uh, removed the Dallas uh, police uh, from, from the investigation, and they told the Dallas police and District Attorney Wade what to say, okay? And so that, that's, that's uh, something that needs to be considered. Now, the, uh, about the eyewitnesses, uh, you know that at least 54 people uh, are on record as having uh, testified either in the Warren Commission or in, uh, in interviews, uh, 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 statements and stuff, that uh, they saw they saw and heard shots from the front of the limousine, okay? So it's a lot more than just a couple of people. We, you know, we're talking about uh, probably half of the people that were in Dealey Plaza that day. Even people that were in the doorway, like Billy Lovelady and Bill Shelley, they went running to the uh, railroad yards, you know, where everybody else was going. Jean Hill, you know, she ran up the stairs. She went chasing for a gunman, you know. And, uh, and so on. And Roger Craig, you know, you mentioned Roger Craig. He's, he's, he's one of my heroes because Roger Craig maintained, you know, exactly what you were talking about. Both of you mentioned him. And, you know, the, uh, Roger Craig, the year before, had been, uh, had been nominated in, and won uh, uh, an award for excellency, you know, as, as a law enforcement officer. You know, so, you know, then, for, you know, one year to the next, you know, this, his whole life, you know, is appended you know, and, and he, you know, ends up, you know, like you said, you know, committing suicide because, you know, that's, uh, that's something that, uh, you know, uh, I, I don't believe in either. Now, uh, you mentioned uh, Roland, uh, Ar Arnold Roland. I, I just want to mention about Arnold Roland. Uh, he was only, he was a high school student like both of you. And he was standing there with his wife. He, he, uh, he married very, very young. And he was, he was still in high school. And he was there with his wife, B Barbara. And even though Barbara was a little uh, 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 nearsighted, she could see, you know, what R uh, Roland also saw, you know, which were, you know, people there in, in, in uh, two people in the east, southeast, and also, like you say, on the other side, you know, of the floor. And, uh, and, and how did they go about uh, dealing with him? Well, they, went, they did what you mentioned. They tried to discredit him. So he's another of the witnesses that they do uh, they, did, they did try to discredit, and they even went to his high school, you know, and checked out his high school records and everything, you know, and they, they uh, you know, so, so that's how, you know, this whole MO is starting to, uh, and, and there's just too many coincidences, you know, like you, like you mentioned, you know. Now, uh, the, about the washing of the limo, you also have to add that, uh, that they took uh, John Connolly's clothes, you know, and they sent him to the cleaners right away. They confiscated them, and, you know. That's it, you know, and, and all this evidence is being destroyed, you know, which, which I, I think is, is uh, instrumental in building a case because a lot of this stuff is, like, you, like both of you have mentioned, is not admissible, period. If, if, uh, if uh, a prosecutor tries to bring this up, you know, he's not gonna, he's not gonna stand 30 seconds, you know, a judge is just gonna throw it out, okay? Now, uh, just one, one, I'm sorry, go ahead. Larry, I had a question. If you concede that point there, wouldn't that also be a strong point to prove conspiracy? Because from the get go, they knew that they never could build a legal case. Of course, of course. Uh, uh, and and, and uh, just a little word of caution here. Um, sometimes you, know, you both go into conclusions that uh, would, not be, would not be allowed in, in, a, in a court of law. Like you can't say a government's forged, you know, or you can't say 
the government lied or the DPD lied. You know, you, you have to present the facts and let the jury decide, you know, based on what you were presenting them. Okay. Uh, now, Madison, you know, uh, the, tremendous also, you know, the uh, thing about the driver's license, I wanted to add um, in, in, in Louisiana, um, it's known that uh, the uh, motor vehicle uh, agency, uh, they purged all of Lee Oswald's uh, driver's license records. Okay, and there are witnesses uh, that uh, there are documents that show that uh, they, these witnesses, you know, uh, testified to this, you know, in interviews, you know, and these are people that were never brought before the Warren Commission, obviously, because this would have uh, shown, you know, how all of this uh, frame, you know, occurred. And uh, now this uh, Bernie Hare who saw uh, Lee Oswald taken out the back alley. Well, if, if you've been to the uh, Texas uh, theater, the alley is actually on the side, okay? So uh, this happened, uh, when, when this happened, not only uh, were other cops there waiting, but Bill Alexander, the assistant district attorney, was there. And there's another interesting point that you, that you uh, brought up, Madison, and I wanted to uh, expand a little bit on that. Uh, and, and what you're doing in analyzing the movements of these Dallas Police Department officers is right on, it's spot on, okay? And when, when, you, when you question why, why would Westbrook be there arresting Oswald, well, he wasn't the only one who was there. Paul Bentley, who was in, in that, in, uh, prominently, you know, shown in that photograph arresting Oswald, you know, uh, uh, tussling with Oswald, you know, uh, uh, into the car, you know, outside the, uh, uh, the uh, Texas theater, he was the polygraph. He was head of the polygraph department, okay? So what would he be doing, you know, doing what, you know, regular uh, policemen should have been doing? So I, th I think that's an incredibly important point that you bring, bring up, Madison. Uh, now, uh, also, uh, these, these cops, you know, like you, like you said, they were all at, the, at, all, at, at the three most important events, okay? Yes, but you also have to now, we know that Roscoe White was also, uh, he was at the search of the Payne's house, you know, he was at the Tippett murder scene, you know, and, and now we're starting to get a, a better idea, a better feel for what Os Roscoe White's involvement was in all of this. And, uh, and like I said, going after these, uh, uh, scrutinizing the movements of these police officers is, is a, a field right now that is pretty open. I don't know of anybody that's really... Uh, tried to do this, and and I would go on and and go on and, and research this further. I would encourage you to go ahead and, and do that because there's not that much uh, out there, you know, right now. Now, uh, to give you an example, Gus Rose, and I and I put this up on my blog a few months ago. Gus Rose, Gus, Gus Rose, was was involved. If you go and research Randy Adams, he was framed for a, mur a murder right there in Dallas. Well, Gus Rose tried to frame him and he tried in an interrogation in an in interrogation he actually tried to put a gun in his hands you know so the fingerprints would be on the gun okay so and and also district attorney wade uh prosecuted him and he knew he was he was innocent and this conviction was overturned later on but the same players were using the same mo as with lee oswald and that's why that's why i bring this up in, in my blog because we're talking about the same players and uh, this Rose, uh, this Rose guy who who uh, helped frame uh, Randy Adams, um, they wouldn't they wouldn't even allow him a phone call, okay? Which is exactly what they did to Lee Oswald. So you see this whole uh, thing sort of like they were used to. This is something that the Dallas Police Department had done before, obviously with Lee Oswald, and uh, you know, and in in light of uh, all these convictions by Wade that have been overturned recently, you know, it's it's I think it's just the tip of the iceberg. Uh, now, it, another another guy that was at all the uh, events was Hugh Ainsworth, okay, and he was a reporter who is really, uh, 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 we all know that he's uh, agency connected, and uh, he's been uh, one of these uh, reporters that have all, all from day one, uh, reported that Lee Oswald was a lone assassin, you know, and he's been, uh, you know, with, with Warren Commission and, you know, so on and so forth. Um, so. He's another one who was also at all these different events, you know, uh, during the weekend. Uh, now, now, which you mentioned Hill, and now, now, and another thing that I just wanted to stress here, when when you do uh, your research, is documents. Okay, I, I nothing beats documents. Okay, but you have to be careful with the documents that that you study. A lot of these documents, 
for example, uh, the Mexico City documents have all been falsified. Okay, and uh, so the, you, yes, it's important to uh, look at documents and use them, but you have to know their source and you have to study them uh, properly uh, in order to see how it ties into the case. And uh, another thing uh, you mentioned about the USSR, the Soviet Union. Well, you know, they, not only the Soviet Union, but France, Germany, they all laughed at how naive the American public could be in accepting this, okay? And, and the very first authors that published books about the assassination were in France and Germany. Uh, uh, Joaquin Jostin, Leo Savage, all of these guys. And when in the U.S., nobody would even publish anything. You know, like I said before, Harold Weisberg had to self-publish. Well, these guys were in Europe. And they could publish whatever they wanted, you know, and not have the repercussions, you know, of the government, you know, falling out, you know, and, and the apparatus of the government falling up upon them. So, uh, you know, that's that's right on, you know, and, and uh, you know, all these governments, you know, in the whole world, the, the only country where that believed that Lee Oswald shot Kennedy was the, the people of the United States. OK, um, now, that document that you showed about the CIA training Oswald, be careful with that because uh, I've read, I've, read uh, I've done research on that and it's, the jury is still out as far as its uh, authenticity, okay? Um, uh, that's something that uh, you gotta be very careful with. And like I said, uh, my, my final advice is always try to be factual and analytical and you will, you will get the truth out. <laughs> All right. Thank you. Thank you. Professor. Yeah, let me uh, pull up. How we know Lee was framed, and by the way, I, 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 I believe you have shown conclusively even that the Dallas Police Department was responsible for framing Lee Oswald. Now, we all know the official account, three shots from the sixth floor window, which has been falsified on multiple grounds. What's striking about the uh, arrest report, I think, is that it's not tentative. It doesn't say he was arrested as a suspect. It states, this man shot and killed President John F. Kennedy and police officer J.D. Tippett. He also shot and wounded Governor John Conley. Well, it's only 1.40, the assassination took place at 12.30, they've conducted no investigation, and yet you have this definitive assertion that this man shot and killed President John F. Kennedy. I mean, the document itself is, as it were, self-discrediting, because it shows it can't possibly be the case. We now know, of course, that the famous photograph taken by James uh, Ike Alchins, AP photographer, not only shows the bullet hole in the windshield where JFK's left ear would be if his left ear were visible, a small white spiral nebula with a dark hole in the center, but in the background just above in this region here, a figure extending out who as many have widely believed to have been uh, Lee Oswald, a figure standing beside him with his hands raised, has had his face blacked out, but notice how the shoulder of the figure leaning out is missing, it, 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 as though he had a towel over it. And when we look more closely, we find there's a figure known as a black tie man, both in front of and behind him at the same time, which is an optical impossibility. Notice a figure with his hands raised has had his face blacked out, that his shirt has been obfuscated by a massive uh, addition of white material but that he's wearing a short sleeve shirt, which makes it to me incredible that anyone would believe that the photograph has never been altered because these features make it, uh, it, it what I would suggest is conclusive proof of alteration. We know that well, uh, Lee told Fritz during his interview that he was out with Bill Shelley in front, uh, which means that we have to investigate his uh, alibi, since obviously that's the most important of all the information he gave to Fritz. When he was arrested, he bore a striking resemblance to the figure in the doorway in terms of the height, the weight, the build, the shirt, and the t-shirt, where the shirt was a very richly textured long sleeve shirt that had been considerably worn. Look at the lower part that was splayed open to the middle, 
it, I, it was so clear that Oswald resembled the man in the doorway that the Dallas Police Department had him remove his outer shirt before they took his mug shot. Notice a striking contrast, which I believe represents consciousness of guilt. They were working to frame him. They didn't want him to be exonerated. Richard Hook has done brilliant work comparing the features of the shirt of the man in the doorway with features on the shirt of Lee Oswald when he was arrested. This is one of his most preliminary studies. He has found dozens and dozens of similarities that really leave no doubt about it. Here we have a comparison of the Lee Oswald with a man in Mexico City who was photographed eventually leading uh, J. Edgar Hoover to issue a memorandum to his FBI agents in charge stating that someone was in Mexico City uh, impersonating Lee Oswald. L Larry Rivera has found uh, documents in uh, relation to Mexico City that it appears were never intended to be released, where you can see uh, principles in the position to frame Lee talking about how they were going to do it which reinforces our conclusion that Lee was, in fact, never in Mexico City. Here we have from a, a lone nutter website, uh, John McAdams. He, he attempts to cast uh, attention on the man, uh, a face that's obfuscated in your shadow uh, away from the doorway man, but clearly the emphasis is on the checkered shirt because there was a figure, the second from the right, standing there, who, to whom I refer as Gorilla Man because of his profile, clearly much heavier, much larger than Lee, much larger than the man in the doorway, who had a red and black checkered shirt that was buttoned up to the, to, to the neck, which they, <clears throat> the fallback position about the identity of Doorman, therefore, was it was this man in the checkered shirt which it's then claimed was Billy Lovelady, where you had uh, Robert Grodin taking a series of photographs on the right of Billy Lovelady purportedly wearing the same shirt. But if you look at the left, you can see it's obviously not because the shirt on Gorilla Man had a pocket. The shirt on, on Billy Lovelady, the red and black checkered shirt, has no pocket. Here we have Billy going to the FBI on the 29th of February, 1964, wearing the shirt that he wore at the time. It was a red and white, vertically striped shirt. It was a short sleeve shirt. It looked nothing like the shirt on Doorman. The FBI nevertheless sent a memorandum back to J. Edgar Hoover, uh, uh, identifying him as the man in the doorway. Notice the underlying sentence at the uh, first end of the first full paragraph, he stated he was wearing a red and white vertically striped shirt and blue jeans during the time he was present in the doorway observing the shooting. Now, Larry has done absolutely sensational work with overlays where you can take photographs that might seemingly appear to be of two different persons to determine if they're the same, just as the two top photographs look as though they might be different persons, but they turn out, of course, to be one and the same Marilyn Monroe. He did this, found suitable uh, uh, photographs to use to impose over the figures in the doorway and found that, as you can see here, uh, the man in the doorway not only has the height, the weight, the build, the shirt, the T-shirt that Lee Oswald was wearing, but he has the same facial features. When you compare Lee on the left with Billy on the right, you see, while it fits Lee, hand in glove, it does not fit Billy. The chin is wrong, the ears are wrong, the nose is wrong. Clearly, the man in the doorway extending out is, is Lee Oswald rather than Billy Lovelady. Larry has also been able to establish, however, that the man holding his hands which fits Billy's own description of himself as being two to three inches shorter, 50 to 20 pounds lighter. And of course, the testimony he gave to the FBI on the 29th of February, 1964, that he was wearing a red and white vertically striped t-shirt, even the facial features fit Billy. So that it looks from <clears throat> Richard Hook's reconstruction that they took elements internal to the original photograph to preserve the texture and other features. 
in order to create the composite that we see in the Altons we have been subjecting to study, but that if you put it together properly, what you would have when you fill in the shirt, when you remove the black tie man from over the shoulder of doorman, it would have looked as we see on the right. In fact, here is another reconstruction Larry has done uh, using Blender in which you see a reconstruction of the image in the doorway. And you can tell therefore why they had to obfuscate the photograph and black it out. Here's yet another. I, I cannot say enough in complimenting Larry for his uh, brilliant work in confirming the conclusion we'd already established based upon the height, the weight, the build, the shirt and the t-shirt to wit, that the man in the doorway known as Doorman was Lee Harvey Oswald, which not only means he cannot have been the lone demented gunman, but that he cannot have been one of the shooters. In terms of framing Lee, the life in the backyard photographs, here we have the famous photograph that appeared on the cover of Life magazine that was intended to implicate him as having the motive and the means. The public already knew he had the opportunity by being at the book depository as an employee. So here you have him holding the man liquor Carcano, a pistol belt with a revolver with which he is alleged to have shot Officer J.D. Tippett, holding two communist newspapers, the worker and the militant, thereby combining means and motive. He was a communist. They, of course, suppress information such as you have reported during your very fine presentations that Lee, in fact, admired JFK. He bore him no malice. I return again to this sh shocking arrest record, which states in a definitive fashion, having no investigation whatsoever taken place, that he was guilty not only of uh, the assassination of JFK and the wounding of Governor Connolly, but of Tippett. Here we have one of the photographs of Lee, uh, describing the arrest as having been about 80 minutes, which would have made it actually at 150 instead of 140. Which uh, uh, that's, I'm sorry, that's that's Paul Bentley. That's uh, with a cigar in his in his mouth, and you know that as a result of that uh, fracas, he twisted an ankle, and then uh, he, 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 yeah, he had to put the ankle in a cast. You know that same day. Ahead, Larry, I previously observed that if it was 80 minutes after, then it was 150, and the arrest record at 140 was therefore written even in advance of the arrest. Can you clarify which time is correct, 140 or 150, for the arrest at the Texas Theater? Well, here it's taking place where they're moving him out, but as you have so ably reported there was another figure coming out in the alley in the background. This shows how far out of his way Lee would have had to go to have shot Tippett. Uh, uh, it, it, it's really preposterous. Aquila Clemens seems to have been the key witness reporting two, uh, two, two uh, men shot Tippett. Neither of them looked like Oswald. If he had come from his rooming house, he would have gone straight up Crawford onto Jefferson, taken a right to the Texas Theater. But as we will now see, there's reason to believe that, in fact, he actually arrived at the theater via the Rambler. Here we have a reconstruction of the shooting uh, from the search for Lee Harvey Oswald by, by uh, Robert Roden, that Tippett approaches a pedestrian. He spokes to the pedestrian through the window. The assassin threw his gun and fired three times. Uh, hitting him in the torso and then walked up and shot him an additional time in the right temple. I have Aquila Clemens testifying about having seen two men, neither of whom looked like Lee Oswald. Here we have the fascinating uh, report from uh, Robert Grodin that appears to be accurate that the shell casings found at the scene initially had been ejected from automatics. They're technically, of course, semi-automatics. Automatics, you depress the trigger and it continues firing automatically. With a semi-automatic, it simply automatically reloads each time you pull the trigger. But the automatic shell casing, if you compare the two on the left, is the shorter round. Oswald had a revolver. His shell casing would have been longer. So there were four automatic shell casings, two Western and two Remington Ram, the two different makes, which is further indication of two shooters. Here we have a, a, a report about 
a link between the Tippett murder and the Texas theater by a fellow named Tom Lyons, where he reports in Crossfile uh, where Jim Mars discussed a tape interview with Butch Burroughs, who, who, where someone had come into the theater uh, shortly after one, look at the second paragraph, and that Burroughs actually had sold him popcorn. We find more about that when we do research. Now, uh, Burroughs had told Nigel that uh, uh, Turner, the producer of The Men Who Killed Kennedy, that Oswald entered the theater between 1 and 107, uh, and it would have therefore uh, have been impossible for him to have been in two places at the same time when Tippett was sh uh, uh, killed uh, around 110. Uh, here is fascinating about Stephen Westberg and Pete Engwald looking at the Tippett case from a different angle. Here they're suggesting, you know, Tippett was involved, that he went, uh, uh, you know, to the area but uh, was also being set up financially, and that someone got out of the, the, the theory here they're presenting, which I believe is correct, Oswald got out of the Nash Ranger at the Texas Theater, a theater owned by uh, Howard Hughes, even Robert Mayhew uh, uh, had been a major CIA operator, was Hughes the chief of security. He, he bought a ticket, bought popcorn, uh, it, it, it would appear, therefore, that the individual who went to the rooming house uh, took the uh, uh, jacket uh, was not, in fact, Lee, but someone who looked very much like Lee. We know the backyard photograph was fake now. Uh, we have the, the chin, the wrong chin. We have the insert line between the lower uh, lip and the chin. Jack White uh, realized that the Newspapers provide an internal yardstick and you can determine the height of the individual thereby. So the standing was either only five foot six or the image of the newspapers had been introduced too large, which turns out to be the case. We know about Lee. We know the ha no two handheld snapshots should match. And yet these match with regard to the face exactly indicating that what he told Fritz to wit that it was his face pasted on someone else's body, and that with time he'd be able to prove it. Here is an observation from Robert Blakey, who headed the House Select Committee investigation. If the backyard photographs are invalid, how they were produced poses far-reaching questions in the area of conspiracy. For the events, a degree of technical sophistication that would almost necessarily raise the possibility that someone conspired not only to kill the president, but to make Oswald a patsy. And of course, we've been able to show that they were indeed fabrications. In fact, Larry has observed that uh, 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 while Jim Mars and I had concluded that Roscoe White had been the stand-in because he had the blocked chin, the same approximate height, weight, and build, though we'll find Roscoe's actually a huskier guy than Lee. He had this odd lump on his wrist from a bone that he'll write. Larry has observed that Roscoe actually knew a lot about photography. Uh, I would say he's, his surmise that Roscoe probably uh, produced the photographs himself uh, is correct. This was a ghost image found in the desk of a Dallas detective. And of course, we know now Larry has found an image of Roscoe that enables us to superimpose and see that he is the stand-in. This is confirmation of his serving as the stand-in for Lee, where Larry's more recent work, by the way, shows that if you juxtapose Lee Oswald's own image against the image of the figure in the back door photographs, Lee is slighter, slighter than the back uh, it, it, it figure in those photographs, which of course is consistent with, Ro with Roscoe who is more robust having created them. Here's yet another. Larry again has done completely brilliant work here to confirm conclusions, you know, to solidify and strengthen the conclusions at which we had previously arrived. Uh, uh, you can find more about all of this in, in my fourth, most recent book, JFK, Who, How, and Why, which has 15 contributors. And of course, in Larry's forthcoming book, the four J.F. Corey Horsemen, which I'm very proud will be produced by uh, moonrockbooks.com. Great pleasure to, to be here to participate with you. And I think your, your students, Mike, are doing a sensational job. What, what they are exhibiting 
is the methodological attitude uh, advanced by the great British philosopher Karl Popper, who says if you want to tell whether or not a theory is true, you have to test it by attempting to falsify it. If you find through repeated attempts to falsify a theory that you're unable to succeed, you have reason to believe the theory is true. In the case of the Warren Commission's theory of Lee Oswald as a lone assassin, repeated attempts to falsify have falsified the theory again and again and again. So that I conclude that conspiracy theorists who are demonized in the press are actually more intelligent uh, more open-minded and more intellectually able to process information because instead of being passive recipients who simply accept what the government tells them, they're taking the active measure of testing it in accordance with the falsificationist methodology of Karl Popper to determine whether or not the theories were being told by the government are or are not true. And again and again and again, whether we're talking about JFK or 9-11 or Sandy Hook or the Boston bombing, or even Charlottesville or Las Vegas, we find what we have been told is not true, where the greatest murder mystery in history has been resolved by attempted efforts at falsification and the consequences that follow in terms of who would have been in the position to falsify the evidence, including altering the x-rays to patch a blowout at the back of the head, substituting another brain for that of JFK, and massively revising the Zapruder film, because none of those things could have been done by some of the popular candidates for the assassination. The KGB, for example, even if it had the ability to alter films comparable to CIA, could not have got its hands on the Zapruder. The mafia could not have extended its reach into Bethesda Naval Hospital to alter x-rays under control of naval officers or the agents of the Secret Service or the president's personal physician. Pro-anti Castro Cubans could not have substituted someone else's brain for that of JFK. We're talking about a very narrow <coughs> class of, of participants, including the Secret Service, uh, the military and the military hospital, uh, the FBI covering it up, Lyndon Johnson and J. Edgar Hoover. So I want to compliment you, Mike, and your students for doing absolutely sensational work. I predict they're going to have very successful futures because they show active intelligence, a willingness to be open-minded and to pursue the truth wherever it may lead. Thank you very, Thank you very much. much. Uh, this has been very fascinating, and I think that you've seen since we talked to you last that the kids have done a, a lot more research, and this could actually prove the idea that you can ha you can be a researcher at any age, and this needs to continue. I think that's absolutely right, Mike, and I think that uh, Madison and Lance were really impressive. I mean, what they showed was sensational. I mean, that quantity of information for time spent in presenting was just uh, phenomenal. And I, I just want to compliment you and your students for the way in which you've been pursuing this with intelligence and aggression and discretion in, in sorting things out to emphasize a bottom line from Larry. A key feature in, in attempting to uh, evaluate theories is to authenticate the evidence. We find the government is fabricating evidence again and again and again. It did that with regard to JFK, as we've seen here. It's been done with regard to 9-11. It's been done with regard to Sandy Hook, the Boston bombing, Charlottesville, the Las Vegas. So I say, you know, keep at it. Keep going. Keep an open mind. Keep being aggressive and not taking anything for granted. I acknowledge that most Americans ha have to spend their time earning enough money to keep a roof over their head and food on the table. They, they take what they hear from the media as though it were true. If they hear the same report from ABC, from CNN, from MSNBC, they assume they're hearing the same thing because there have been independent investigations. What we have to appreciate is that the CIA realized they had to infiltrate and control the media if they were going to be able to succeed in manipulating the opinions of the American people through Operation Mockingbird. 
for as early as 1975, William Colby, then its director, testified to Congress that the agency owned everyone of significance in the media. In that day and age, there was no alternative media, which is why they're so frustrated today. Too much truth is getting out by independent researchers who are not taking for granted what they're told, who are willing to test and evaluate the theories they're given and who are discovering in case after case that the evidence has been fabricated to give a striking illustration in relation to Sandy Hook. We've now been able to demonstrate how they created the kids out of photographs of older children when they were younger. We have proven it for Noah Posner, who is the most celebrated of the Sandy Hook kids because he's so unusual. He not only died on 14 December of 2012 in Newtown, but again on 16 December 2014 in Pakistan, where his father, presumptive Lenny Posner, sent Kelly Watt uh, a, a death certificate for Noah when she challenged him. It turned out to be a fabrication, the bottom half of a reel, the top half of a fake. It had no file number. It had the wrong estimated time of death. But Kelly also noticed there was a striking resemblance between photographs of Noah and of his older stepbrother, Michael Favner. We made it a collaborative project and have proven that Noah Posner was made out of photographs of Michael Favner. And it's astonishing to report that the deep state has been taking down the images that prove the case. They deleted one of my blogs a, a couple of weeks ago. Uh, two days ago, they deleted another of my blogs. I repeat, I have backup copies, so I'm able to put them back up. But it's further confirmation that we have discovered how they did it, and the deep state does not want the American people to know. And, and it's just a continuation of exactly what happened to JFK and, and before that, because that's the way uh, history is, Jim. You know, there's just, um, you know... <laughs> Uh, history is written by the victors, okay? So, you know. Or as Voltaire put it, history is a pack of lies, the living play upon the dead. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, I just want to, uh, again, in, in closing, uh, uh, my last advice would be to remind you that technology has caught up with the photographic evidence that has, has been left, you know, behind. Okay, and the uh, already technology has demonstrated uh, that all this evidence uh, is, has been falsified, has been altered. Um, the Zapruder film, you know, Douglas Horn, yourself, uh, Dr. Fetzer, you know, and the people that you put together in your great book, The Great Zapruder Film Hoax, uh, is a must read. Okay, for you uh, young uh, people, you know, that are starting to get into the case, uh, the movie JFK, uh, you have to start there. You know, and uh, I don't know if it's still available, you know, like used to you used to be able to uh, rent uh, videos, DVDs and stuff like that, you know, but I'm sure you can get a, a copy, you know, from eBay or from one of the uh, distributors, you know, cheap, you know, because it's worth having, you know, in your, in your library, because it's something that, uh, you know, it prepares you for the case moving forward. Now, uh, some people might say, and I've mentioned it before. Uh, happened 54 years ago, you know, why are you still, you know, hung up on this? Well, historians of the future, you know, are going to look at our work and they're the ones that are going to decide, you know, exactly what happened here. You know, obviously we're still living, you know, the aftermath of the cover up. Okay. But uh, the more work that we put into, the more documents that we study, the more uh, uh, research that we do and, and connecting the dots and everything, uh, are going to be, uh, are going to determine uh, in the future, you know, how historians, you know, write this up, you know, so that when uh, the history books that you have right now will reflect what really happened. Again, thank you so much. And I know you have some uh, uh, commitments to go to, and we appreciate the time. Uh, I'll, I'll be emailing you because I have a couple schools that kind of watch some today and they're interested in, in trying to do this again like we did with Canada, but they're interested in trying to do one next month on uh, if we land on the moon or not. <laughs> <laughs> I'll send you some resources you can kick around, Mike, if I haven't already done so. Yeah, I, I'll, yeah, if you could on that, that would be really good. Uh, it's a real special group of people. I've been working with them for probably 10 to 15 years now. Uh, 
the, the people in Turkey are, are uh, she's from Bursra. Uh, her, her kids are very marvelous and uh, they, they're very anxious to uh, get an opportunity to, to do something like this. And, and like you say, I think that the process of learning is uh, more important than, um, than tear up the books and, and try to do something like this be a lot more important for the kids to learn. Well, Mike, I want to compliment you on your brilliance in pursuing this with your students this way and encouraging them to do original research. I think that uh, uh, Madison and Lance demonstrated to get today conclusively that high school students are capable of doing high quality research. This was very impressive. And I simply congratulate you and the program of which you are a part for advancing the study of serious subjects at this level of education it, it is to be applauded by the whole world. Well, I appreciate that very much. We might use that clip to show it to other people because a lot of people are very uh, afraid of trying to do something different. This isn't really like Larry said, this isn't different. This has been going on for 54 years, whether it be Mary Woodward, uh, I forget her last name, she passed away this, this summer. But uh, when she wrote that story, and they were changing the story as we speak, yeah. she explains quite a bit of stuff that, you know, the, and then Bill Newman backs it up with saying that President Kennedy stood up in the car, and uh, that's all missing from the Zabruder film. Secret Service gets out, the, the car stops, that's all missing from the Zabruder film. Most of the stuff is already there. We just need to go flush it out. Well, there's no benefit, Mike, from from going through life being played for a sap by your government. If you're being told something by your government and it doesn't look right, test it, check it out. See if it's capable of resisting attempts at falsification. Because as we've seen here today in the case of JFK, once you undertake a serious effort to falsify the official narrative, it falls apart in many different directions. This is an excellent exhibition of what can be accomplished by high school students today. And I again, I compliment Madison, Lance, and you, Mike, and your whole program for undertaking this project. Okay, thank you so much, and we'll end it there. I have a, a Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year, and we'll see you next year. Thank you. You got it. Uh, Lance and Bye. Madison. Great job, Lance and Madison. Congratulations. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Uh, yeah.